Good afternoon, my name is Major General Richard Felton and I command the UK Defence's Joint Helicopter Command with its headquarters based here in Andover. And I understand first of all you'd like to know a bit about the Helicopter Command, um, what its structure is and how it supports UK Defence. Well, the Joint Helicopter Command really came about in the late 90s as a result of one of the defence reviews and really sought to corral all the battlefield helicopters from the three single services in UK Defence. And so I command currently the Commander Helicopter Force, which is uh, Royal Navy aircraft, uh, the Support Helicopter Force of Puma and Chinook, which is RAF aircraft, and the Army Air Corps and Army Aircraft, um, mainly based at the moment around the Lynx, the Apache, uh, and the Wildcat coming into service. And uh, I work within the Army headquarters. I work to command a field army, who's a three-star general. Um, but my outputs are across defence, uh, to the Army, to the Navy, and also to the Special Forces. And the JHC um, has been under some change recently, um, under the recent Army Command Review. Um, I used to command 16 Air Assault Brigade, but now that uh, formation has moved directly under Commander Field Army. Uh, and in the future, I'll probably get unmanned uh, air systems, the watchkeeper system, uh, from the Army under my command. What is the present position regarding the helicopter fleet? We're undergoing quite a lot of change, not only is our structure changing and our command and control, but uh, we are doing a lot of recapitalisation. In fact, nearly every aircraft type is being changed or modified, and this is a really, really good thing for the JHC. It not only um, shows the importance that uh, helicopters have in the UK defence lexicon, but also keeps us with a battle-winning fleet. And I would say this, but we uh, will have probably one of the best helicopter fleets in the world in terms of their capability. And let me go through some of those changes. Um, we are, for example, getting uh, considering a new Apache, the Apache E model, that will replace our current D model, and that will happen over the next four to five years or so, uh, and we expect to get 50 of those uh, E models. And that will give us a far greater capability, not only in the aircraft itself, uh, being able to fly faster, uh, longer distances, um, and carry more weight, um, but most importantly, it's connectivity to the joint uh, battle space, and that's the real um, bonus it'll give. And also we hope to team that aircraft uh, with um, uh, UAVs as well. And the watchkeeper coming under my command will aid with that. But of course you can imagine we've got to do lots of force development to make sure we get the best mix out of that system. If I could stay with the Army Air Corps initially, um, the Lynx Mark 7 is now out of service, that's the Lynx with the skids. Uh, that left our service last year in March. And the Lynx Mark 9 Alpha, uh, the Lynx with wheels, uh, that saw great service in Herrick uh, in Afghanistan, is leaving service um, at the end of March in 2018. And that's going to be replaced mainly by the Wildcat. Uh, the Wildcat is now in service with the Navy and 847 Squadron, and it saw its first literal um, operational capability in October last year. And the 1st Army Air Corps Squadron is going through uh, the conversion to type package uh, and it should be operational in about 18 months time. And the Wildcat brings an amazing capability. It's not a Lynx, um, it is mainly an iStar platform with uh, really significant um, electro-optic and infrared sights and a very impressive communication suite and a digitised cockpit for the aircrew. Uh, and that Wildcat will be in service with the Army Air Corps with 847 Naval Air Squadron and there'll probably be a Special Forces attribution in due course. The um, uh, support helicopter force has been recapitalised as well. Uh, the Puma 1 uh, has been completely modified to now produce Puma 2. Puma 2 reached its uh, full operating capability only a couple of weeks ago, but it has been on service in Afghanistan for almost a year. And the difference is a glass cockpit, um, a digital uh, automatic flight control system, and some very impressive performance from its engines. For example, it's got single engine performance at all up mass. And so that's really enhanced the Puma Force's capability. Uh, and the second area, the Chinook Force itself, and the Chinook has gone through quite a considerable modification program. We now are fully, fully digitized with our Chinooks, uh, with a new glass cockpit under a program called Julius. We are now seeking to make all our Chinooks um, with digital automatic flight control system, DAFIX, and that program will start in the next couple of years. And we've also now fully got into service our new buy of 14 Mark VI Chinooks, and these are 
uh, specially modified with digital flight control systems and glass cockpits. Uh, moving on to the Navy and the Commander Helicopter Force, uh, they have um, really, they, they're going through a period of change where the Sea King will go out of service. It's largely out of service now. We only have a, number, a few uh, Sea King left and that's currently doing a, a, um, a, com a commitment that we have. And that will be replaced by the Merlin. The Merlin has seen its, um, its service change from the RAF to the Navy uh, last year. And we're going through a transition period now of re-equipping the Naval Air Squadrons with Merlin uh, Mark III and III Alpha at the moment. Uh, the Merlin will then go through a transition program to an interim Mark III uh, to really give it a, an early capability to operate from ships and then to be fully recapitalized for 25 Merlin at the Mark IV standard by 2022. And uh, 847 Naval Air Squadron are switching from Lynx to Wildcat. I've already been through that, and that process is going very well. So you can see a lot of change in the JHC, uh, keeping up with the most modern capability to provide aircraft that not only are very capable, but also offer the best safety for our pilots and those that fly in them. What are your priorities regarding training and preparing for future global contingency operations? Yet more change, because what we see in the JHC is um, Having finished 10 years of campaigning in Afghanistan and Iraq, we're now going to an area that we call contingency. In Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, we were operating in theatres from normally pretty well-founded bases from some fairly um, single locations, uh, fighting an enemy that we knew very well, that was largely unsophisticated, although, although the levels of combat were pretty high in places. Um, in an environment we knew, in a climate we knew, and with friends that we knew as our allies. Contingency is completely the opposite. We don't know where we might be going, we don't know who with, we don't know who our friends will be, we don't know what the enemy is, what the threat is, or the environment is. And so we have to get the mindset change in our crews to really change the way we train and what we train for so that we can deal with that uncertainty and have that mental agility to deal with the problems that we face. Now, this training is quite extensive, the change, because we have to make sure that leadership at the most junior levels is exercised properly in a thing called mission command, where the commander gives a mission and resources and tells what he wants the junior subordinate to achieve and allows the junior to get on and decide how to do that. And that requires training and trust. We also have to consider about what an aircraft sortie profile looks like in contingency, because it's different from the very set profiles and SOPs we had for Afghanistan. And, and one of the most important things we have to do is to make sure that we are comfortable with dealing in what we're calling a contested, a degraded, and an operationally limited environment. So that is flying against a kinetic threat, uh, that is flying as if we can't guarantee air superiority, and that is flying against an enemy that could potentially degrade the environment uh, through electronic warfare, through jamming uh, various natures. And of course, you can imagine that requires us to look very carefully the training we give our, our people. We've also got to make sure that we support other people's training because helicopters tend to be not only a capability in their own right, but tend to enable others on the battlefield. And we've got to make sure that we remain very closely engaged with uh, those land formations we, we provide support to, the 3rd United Kingdom Division, and also the lead armoured and armoured infantry task forces. And on the Navy side, the lead, lead commander group uh, the Air Assault Task Force, 16 Air Assault Brigade, um, and any other customers that we might have. So it's quite a large training remit and a substantial piece of work to make sure we get, in the, we get everyone trained to the right level. And this also includes uh, amphibious operations? It does, yes. Um, our support to the Lead Commander Group means that we have to uh, have crews that are trained to operate from ships, and we've done that quite extensively last year. And during the period of recapitalization where the commander helicopter force are changing, as I explained, from Seeking to Merlin. Uh, we've got to make sure that we can cover that change period uh, with other lift aircraft. So you'll see more Chinooks regularly at sea uh, for the foreseeable future, covering that lift gap, as I call it. Uh, in addition, Apache will continue to operate from ships. This is an essential capability for the lead commander group um, and others, and we'll make sure that they maintain their maritime um, experience. Uh, JHC aircraft will also be embarked on the new aircraft carriers? Absolutely. Um, it's inconceivable that the new aircraft carrier will go to sea without a, a literal capability, literal manoeuvre capability and um, a special forces capability. And we are, are in, the, um, in the forecast events, so to speak, for the ship. 
that very soon after it gets handed over to the military, uh, the JHC aircraft will be operating uh, and generating capabilities from that ship. What have been your main priorities as Commander JHC? Um, my main priorities are to make sure that we produce a capability that's relevant um, and is safe to those many customers that we support. And in doing so, dealing with the, the change that we have to go through. Um, that is making sure that we change our training to reset to contingency, and I've covered some of that. It's making sure that my crews, uh, that my engineers and my ground staff are, um, uh, understand the best they can are and are as best prepared for the contingent environment. And it's, all, it's also making sure that our capability, our um, equipment program stays up to where it should be. And I think I've explained through our recapitalization that that is in a really good place. And to make sure that we remain safe. And joint operations, interoperability? Yes, all our operations will be joint. And on the interoperability side, we've made some really good um, headway with the Americans, with the 82nd Airborne Division, where when I commanded 16 Brigade, we um, did exercises to prove that a 16 Brigade battle group, in effect, could work within the 82nd Airborne Division as a credible and sustainable capability. We're working with the 82nd uh, Cavalry uh, Brigade, the, 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 um, the aviation that's part of 82nd Airborne, uh, to work out how we can operate with them. We're doing the same with the French, with 11 Parachute Brigade, and also with um, Div Aero, which is the French aviation component, the Operational Army Aviation component, which is shortly to change again and move under uh, Comelat, the, um, the commander of French aviation and I enjoy a very good relationship with him in trying to um, integrate our aviation and make sure that we can operate together. And I'm very open to other partners as well. Um, I've had visits to our, my German colleagues and we hope in the future to do some training with Germans as well.